700. 1230 You're in touch with Cinto in the afternoon on your direct connection. Talk Radio, 1230 WCOL. You can participate by calling 821 WCOL. The views expressed are those of Michael, his guests, and callers, and not necessarily those of the staff, management, or sponsors of WCOL. And good afternoon, everybody. We, uh have sort of a surprise guest this afternoon, one we were not anticipating yesterday, but certainly a pleasure to have him in studio with us. Uh, Mr. John DeLorean is here. It's Mike, DeLorean, it's nice to be here. Town. I, should I say welcome back to class? <coughs> oh, yeah, it's my third trip in the last two months. Okay. You've been a busy man, not necessarily uh, the most pleasurable of the last couple of years, but you've been a busy man the last couple I of years. I would say that's you. absolutely true. Uh, we're going to get into... Uh, into your ventures uh, in the auto industry and, and in the future in just a few minutes, but obviously there are some questions uh, about uh, some of the things of the past, uh, the trial that you went through, and uh, I, you know, I, I hear an awful lot of things. I read uh, an awful lot about the case, and I heard it called entrapment, and, and why didn't John DeLorean testify at, at his own trial? Uh, was, it, uh, was it entrapment on the part of the government? No, entrapment generally means that a, that a crime was committed, but you cannot be prosecuted for it because the government forced you into it or created the situation, created the circumstances. Mm -hmm. In this instance, there was no entrapment because there was no crime. I was not guilty of any crime because no crime was committed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so consequently, I was you know, found innocent on the basis of no crime. On the other hand, I'm sure that if, uh, if I had done something, it still would have been entrapment because of the way the government put it together. Okay, and by the way, folks, if you have any questions for John DeLorean, he'll be here until about 20 till. So uh, get your questions in as early as you can at 821-WCOL, 821-9265. Uh, is the trial, I have not had a chance to read the book, uh, is uh, the trial outlined in, uh, or, or highlighted at least in the book DeLorean? <laughs> Well, you got to remember, Mike. The transcripts from the trial would fill uh, mm -hmm. two boxcars because box mm -hmm. it was a you know it was very long, went through very protracted jury selection and so on. But uh, the trial is covered quite comprehensively, but in a generalized uh, fashion, including a number of the key points of testimony. However, okay. And uh, by the way, the uh, the book is simply entitled DeLorean, and uh, Zondervan is the publisher. Did you make the government look bad? At your trial? No, I don't think I made the government look bad. I think uh, two things. I think that they made themselves look bad because uh, the government was caught doing a variety of probably six things, any one of which would have thrown out any subsequent conviction anyhow. Uh, the first uh, FBI agent was caught destroying and fabricating evidence. The uh, second agent who testified was a DEA uh, uh, case agent. He uh, perjured himself and he apologized to the jury right in the courtroom for lying to him, which is something I've never ever heard of. The uh, director of the uh, 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 bureau out there in California was caught along with three levels of management backdating and forging documents, which is a felony in and of itself. They were guilty of threatening my attorney, the FBI, I did, and they also tried to plant narcotics on his car. Didn't they threaten your family, too? They, the uh, informant threatened my family, and the FBI agent uh, threatened my family. A number of those threats are right on, recorded on the tape. Uh, when you got all through, the, uh, the prosecutor and the confidential informant perjured themselves before the grand jury some 31 times. Two of the agents were arrested, breaking and entering in the co-defendant's house. So when you put all that together, it was the most outrageous combination of misuses of police power. And I mean, you, that wouldn't even happen in Russia. That's how bad that was. So consequently, uh, the government embarrassed themselves, but they proved that I was absolutely innocent, that it was a frame-up. And at the same time, it was unnecessary for us to really to present any defense. Everyone who testified uh, to any extent was was a government agent or an ex-agent. The only non-agent to testify was my ex-secretary, 
was only on for about 20 minutes on direct, only to confirm that some letters that the government had submitted in evidence were typed by her and that indeed that was her writing on them. Are there a lot of ex-agents as a result of the trial? or No, I'll tell you what really shocks me, Mike. I, I w met with my attorney in California, Howard Weitzman, on Sunday for an hour, and I asked him a specific question. I said, Howard, now you know what happened in a trial. All of these are proven, irrefutable facts that were proven in court. And I said, now, if you had done any one of these things, if you backdated documents, if you fabricated evidence, if you threatened witnesses, if, you know, if you altered tapes, what would happen to you? He said, I would have been immediately indicted and I'd be in prison by now. And what I don't understand is how these men, who have a higher standard, in my opinion, because they are sworn to uphold, they're members of the Department of Justice, sworn to uphold the Constitution and the laws of the United States, and not one single disciplinary action has been taken against any of them, as far as I know. I think it's outrageous. By not doing that, the, every one of these men belongs in prison, but by not doing that, they're encouraging all of them to continue these illegal and dishonest police activities and to take innocent men and destroy their lives to try to make a profit or a bonus or a promotion. Let's talk about the destroying their lives for just a moment. We're talking to John DeLorean, and, and this is probably a tougher question than even the trial, I would imagine, for you, but uh, did this trial cost you your marriage, in your opinion? Well, I don't see how any marriage, Mike, could have made it through the horror that our family was subject to. First, uh, uh, an interesting thing happened when they decided to try to trap. This is when no no evidence that I had ever in my life committed any crime. Uh, they decided they were going to nail me as a target of their investigation. They then sat down. Did they just want a big fish? Is that why they did it? Yeah. What what had happened, uh, uh, as I found out subsequently, is the confidential informant was sitting in the federal building in Los Angeles waiting to testify in another case in February early 1982, in February 1982. In that case, he put his two best friends in prison in exchange for his own freedom. At that time, of course, he was about to lose his $8,000 a month salary as a confidential informant for the government. So he happened to be reading the Wall Street Journal while he was waiting to go on the stand, and there was an article that said, my company needed money. He turned to one of the agents and he said, you know, I met this guy once. And as bad as his company needs money, I guarantee you I can nail him for you. Well, now that was how I was selected. They also talked about trying to get Johnny Carson or some other people, and they decided I was the only one this guy knew. He, of course, was about to lose his 8000 a month, so now he needed a new fish to fry. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he was paid, I think, something like 360000 tax-free. Mm for what happened here. In any event, that nice was how I got yeah. picked. And six months later, they called me, and this whole thing started. You know, the uh, in looking back at, uh, at what transpired, is there any way you could have avoided what they were setting you up for? Well, I tried to avoid it, and I, whether my judgment was all it should have been, I'm not positive. But I, you know, I had advice of lawyers, right? The first time any illegal activity was mentioned, I immediately went to my attorneys, and I said, I think I'm in, I'm in the hands of organized crime here, and I don't know how to escape. Mm -hmm. And today, I guess I'd still have taken my attorney's advice, which ultimately proved to be correct because no crime was committed. On the other hand, uh, you know, the damage was horrendous. Okay, the name of the book again is DeLorean uh, by John DeLorean with Ted Schwartz, and it's published by Zondervan. Let's go to the phone lines right now, 821-WCOL, 821-9265. Can you hear out of those okay? All right. Let's go to Gail from the west side. Hi. Hello, uh, Mr. DeLorean. Hi, Gail. How you doing? Oh, real well. Uh, I've always believed that you were uh, framed, but uh, I was wondering if you had ever thought of the fact that if uh, the three big auto companies had anything to do with the FBI planning all this on you in the first place to get you out of the business. No, I don't think that's true. I know that when I left General Motors, there were a few people that were unhappy with me, but they've all retired and, you know, they're long gone now. But I don't believe that was the case. Well, I was just wondering if, they, if you thought maybe they had, you know, backing on this or something like that. And, and you weren't really competing with them with the DeLorean, were you? I mean, there wouldn't be a, a competition uh, vendetta, would there? Well, what you have to remember is a little tiny factory in uh, Northern Ireland employing 2,600 people 
uh, General Motors, by the wildest stretch of their imagination, would never even know we're in business. Here's a company with uh, six, seven hundred thousand employees worldwide with uh, hundreds of plants and facilities. And we couldn't have been a competitor, really, for anybody for many, many years. Well, Mr. DeLorean, I, it wasn't so much that you was going to be a competitor with them. It was sort of like that you were a thorn in their side because you left Mr. Macho Company here. You, you bucked the structure. Well, I think that it's uh, true, Gail, that anybody who uh, who tries to be his own person automatically is uh, offensive to the organization guy because your very b living is an uh, insult to his manhood. And so I think you do wind up with a lot of people who are upset with you. By the way, I work for General Motors. <laughs> well, thank you. I You're bucking the structure. They may get you next. <laughs> right. okay. I just wondered if you had thought uh, thought of that, you know, during your trial or anything, or beforehand, if that maybe they had something to do, with, not just so much General Motors, but the three big motor companies. Uh, that no, know, I have. It, it I have my mind. I was just wondering. I have no evidence of that at all. Okay, okay. Well, thanks very much. Thank you very much for your call. Again, we're talking to John DeLorean, uh, author of uh, DeLorean by John DeLorean and Ted, with Ted Schwartz, uh, published by Zondervan. And if you have any questions or comments, 821-WCOL, 821-9265. Uh, why Northern Ireland to build a car? Well, <coughs> what happened, uh, Mike, is that we'd put our pr proposals and our programs together, and ultimately when we got through we were judged to be too high a risk project for anybody else to to uh, handle us. Mm -hmm. uh, Northern Ireland, uh, in and of itself, was judged to be too high a risk uh, place to do business. So as a consequence, we wound up having a wedding of convenience. Nobody else wanted to go to Northern Ireland, and nobody else wanted us, so it went together. Okay. Um, did you find the political unrest in Northern Ireland to be a problem? Well, it's a very destabilizing for we here in America who are used to, you know, coming in and out of your house or walking anywhere you want to walk. There, uh, there are barbed wire everywhere, major sections of the downtown, most of the stores. Uh, you go through a full body frisk before you can even go in a department store. If you park a car and try to walk away from it, they won't let you because they're convinced that you've left a truckload of bombs there. And so... Uh, uh, hotels, for example, when you go into a hotel, you're you're searched uh, by hand from head to foot. You're searched by one of these little electronic things, and then your luggage is gone through a piece at a time. On the other hand, they, there's good reason for it. For example, I used to stay at the Europa back in the early days, which is the main hotel downtown, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it had been bombed 29 times or something. You know, yeah. it was always yeah. new because every time you turned around, they had blown it away. You know, I. Uh, mentioned we were talking earlier before we went on the air about uh, uh, about the plant here uh, or wherever it's going to be located uh, hopefully in in central Ohio but uh, you're not really going to firm up any plans until all the the legal problems are are tied up in England what what's well it's not really in England what it is is that the uh, British government through their alter ego the creditors committee has indicated that they would pr try to prevent us from building cars uh, here in Ohio how the hell so, can they do that <clears throat> well they can do it by harassing you with you know they have an infinity of money and a lot of good lawyers they can just drive you crazy so what we've done now is we file suit to to stop them from uh, bothering us, and uh, that now is in federal court here, and hopefully if we prevail, then uh, once that's adjudicated, which could happen very quickly, then we will go ahead and start building cars here. What's happened with the other, uh, the tax trial? That, uh, the one in Detroit? in Detroit? Well, that's an interesting thing, because I was told when the trial ended in California, of course, I had hoped that by that time, uh, having been completely vindicated, everybody would leave me alone and I could get back to my life. But instead of that, I was told by a number of attorneys and by one U.S. attorney from a southern state who prefers to remain anonymous mm. that the Department of Justice was so humiliated by the getting caught with all these illegal acts that they were going to continue to harass me probably forever. And uh, so, lo and behold, they'd had this grand jury convened in Detroit for some three years. And uh, suddenly, the day my book comes out and the day I start on the tour, they decide to indict me. At the same time, uh, when I went before the grand jury to point out to them that the, that the prosecutor had lied to them some 31 times, or the prosecution, in California, and I'd never have been indicted out there if the truth had been told, and I'm sure that's also true in Detroit, that the, these people were told any number of lies. 
uh, when we got all through with that, uh, I was surprised to find in Detroit, which is 92 percent black, that there were 23 whites and one black on the grand jury, which yeah. statistically, I mean, I got a better chance of jumping over the moon than drawing that kind of a panel. In any event, the final thing that happened is at the same time they brought down the indictment, the government got a gag order, so my attorney wasn't even allowed to say that I was innocent. Now, I've never, ever heard of that in another trial in the United States. It's just an absolute obstruction of the freedom of the press. Okay. We're talking to John DeLorean. We're going to take a quick break. We will come back. Our number is 821-WCOL, 821-9265.